Now on PBS, inside the immigration debate, what about the guest worker program that Congress may soon expand? Pretty much the same people, all Mexican all the time. They work long hours under grueling conditions across the country, charges of abuse. He has to put up with whatever crap that employer wants to put on him. He has no choice. I've seen workers get fired for asking for clean drinking water. And will sanctions work against Iran? It's infinitely difficult in terms of diplomacy, but antagonizing the people of the Middle East does not work. All that on now. With David Brancaccio. The weekly news magazine from PBS. Funding for now has been provided by the Orfala Family Foundation, the Park Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, the Town Creek Foundation, the William B. Wiener Jr. Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Now, from New York City, Public Broadcasting's David Brancaccio. Welcome to Now. There is no shortage of evidence that undocumented immigrants live a life open to exploitation. The work tends to be hard, the hours run long, and the workplace protections are few. But how much better is it for people who come to this country to work with the proper visas and permits? The answer is not much. They're called guest workers and are part of a little-known program that's in place right now. Congress is proposing legislation that would expand the program enormously. Producer Michelle Smalley and senior correspondent Maria Inahosa visited the mostly hidden world of guest workers and brought back a cautionary tale. Every day at 5 a.m., it's the same story for these Mexican workers. Three men share a bed in a motel room in Montana. It's early spring, and there's still a chill in the air. There is no heat. Exhaustion permeates the room. There's time for only a quick breakfast of cookies and milk. Outside, the rest of the crew gathers in the cold. The men pile into the van, which will take them to work. They're roughly 2,000 miles away from the place they call home in Mexico. An hour into the trip, they arrive at the low, low national forest, cradled in the Rocky Mountains. You may think these men are undocumented workers, but they are here legally, part of America's guest worker program. We came to Montana to take a closer look at the program. There are allegations of widespread abuse of guest workers, and there's a proposal in Congress that would increase their numbers significantly. Today, this crew will plant pine seedlings in an area previously devastated by a wildfire. Ausencio Yanez has been coming to the United States as a guest worker for the last four years. Even so, he knows little about what a guest worker is. What do you know about what the H-2B visa program is all about? I don't know exactly what it is, just that it's a work permit we're given. So how do you, um, how do you get motivated for a day-long work like this? And most people don't even know you're here. We don't have enough resources in our country. And here we have to work, to struggle, to survive better in Mexico. Yanis and his fellow guest workers make this job look easy, but it's back-breaking labor. The mountains are steep. The soil is loose and rocky, making it easy for the workers to slip. The work is tough, repetitive, physical labor. They plunge their tools into the earth, plant a seedling, move on. Repeat for eight hours a day, six days a week, sometimes more. Most of the labor-intensive work in the woods is done by Latino labor. They've earned a nickname because of it, Los Pineros, the men of the pines. 
the Federal Forest Service has contracted with a company called Oaxaca Reforestation to replant these mountains. Silvino Escalante supervises the crew for the company. He watches them closely, urging the workers to keep up the pace. Does it seem at all strange for you, Silvino, that the replanting that's happening in the U.S. forest preserves is being done by Mexican workers? All the time I work in the Forest, in the forest Service, they're the, pretty much the same people, all Mexican all the time. You know, it's been so a while bringing uh, American people well, just for two or three days and then leaving. I don't like it, hard work. <laughs> Escalante says most of his men have come over on the H-2B visa, which allows companies to request foreign labor to do seasonal work. Like this crew, the vast majority of the guest workers come from Mexico. Escalante says the program has been good for the workers because they're here legally. You would say your workers feel more secure I, because they have H-2B visas. They don't have to worry about so. the immigration yeah. coming yeah. in and, I think so. and doing raids. Yeah. The way I hear, the people says, feel more comfortable, more happy, and more, more, more happy. You think it makes them better workers? I think so. Mm-hmm. Better workers in Escalante's world may mean harder workers. While we were there, production was non-stop. The only break, if you want to call it that, was when the crew climbed back up the mountain to stock up on more seedlings, which they did three times during the day. There was also a paid lunch break, so to speak. The men gathered round, heating tortillas on a small burner but the meal only lasted 18 minutes. The crew was alone in the woods, except for two Forest Service inspectors. The government employees trailed the team at a distance. Their job is to make sure the planting is up to specifications. And so the actual role of the U.S. Forest Service in a contract like this is what? is to ensure that the work that we need to have done is being done appropriately and correctly to, a, to an acceptable quality. But it's about the trees. Right. It's not necessarily about the workers. No. The government has no hard statistics on how many guest workers are actually in the country. The best estimate is roughly 120,000, the number of visas that have been issued. Around the country, there have been news accounts and lawsuits highlighting the exploitation and lack of oversight of guest workers. So there's mounting pressure on the Forest Service to look after the workers and not just the trees. Our people are trained in natural resources. That's their background. That's, that's what they know how to do. Um, but we have had a lot of, of recent training and, and education on what to look for in terms of, of the workers. And what, up until now, have, have you noticed from your own teams that are doing inspections here? I've noticed again with this particular contract, and this is the second year of this contract with this company, it's been exceptionally high quality. The crew would agree with that sentiment. This is as good as it gets for guest workers. Even so, Yanis told us that after almost a year of hard labor, he ends up with just $9,000 to support his wife and three kids. Still, he and his crew are grateful for those kinds of earnings but they do worry about something else. Once a guest worker is hired, they're tied to their employer. Yanis says it's a reality his crew talks about a lot. In a way, it might feel like slavery. When you have that visa, you work for that particular company. You can't go work for another company. So in that sense, you are enslaved. What happens is, is that if you wanted to ask for, say, a, a raise, if the boss realizes you're the one organizing it, the next year there's no visa for you. You get cut off. When you hear Americans saying that workers like you are taking jobs away from American citizens, what do you say? I would simply like to see them do that work, and I don't see them doing it. That's why we Hispanos are here, because of that difficult work. They wouldn't do it, and much less for the pay one gets. Uh, we, we bring in single uh, males, able-bodied, we use them, and then we want them to go back home. Roman Ramos is a paralegal with the Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. 
Over the course of his career, he's advocated for numerous guest workers in their complaints of unfair treatment by U.S. companies. Ramos is part of a growing chorus of critics who believe the guest worker program is good in theory, but is often highly exploitative in practice. The, the guest worker comes into the country after going through a great deal of expense. Once in the U.S., he's vulnerable. He can only work for one employer. One employer. He has to put up with whatever crap that employer wants to put on him. He has no choice. I've seen workers get fired for asking for clean drinking water. Ramos has documented these abuses. And for him, there's personal history as well. His parents were migrant workers, and as a young man, he worked in farming too. He says conditions now are often similar to those he witnessed as a boy. In most of these jobs, uh, or in isolated areas, the workers are sort of kept separate and apart from society. Talk about dependency, talk about isolation. You, know, you depend on this person for your basic survival, food. And then you got to depend on him to take you into town to buy the damn food. Just how bad can it get for guest workers? Meet Hugo Martin Resinos Resinos. Six years ago, Resinos says he worked as a farmer in Guatemala, earning the equivalent of two U.S. dollars a day while supporting his family. He says a cousin told him about a recruiter in Guatemala who was looking for workers to reforest private lands in the United States. They told us it was to plant pine trees. But in Guatemala, we didn't know anything about what it meant to plant pine trees. I asked him how much it would cost to get the job, and he said all the expenses would be $1,600. I told him that would be fine, because I needed to improve my family's situation. $1,600, a fortune in Resino's world. But he was told it was the only way to get the job which is why, he says, he agreed to the next demand. He claims the recruiter asked for the deed to Resino's family home as collateral. We had to leave the deed with them, so once we got to the United States, no one would run off. No one would leave the company. And if you left the company, they told us we'd lose our property. Resino's came to the States and began working with a company called Express Forestry. He was told he would receive an hourly wage. But once he began working, he says the company reneged and paid him for piecework. He was paid for the number of trees he planted. In the end, he says, he sometimes made less than minimum wage. When you first got to the United States, you were coming legally to work here as a guest worker. What was going on inside for you? I was thinking about making money, earn a little bit and send it home. Do something to live a better situation later. When I got here, everything changed. You didn't earn that much in that company. It was hard to make money. Resino says Express Forestry deducted the cost of the equipment from his paycheck and that he also had to pay for motel rooms while on location. After taxes and with all of his expenses, he says he sometimes made as little as $50 a day. Resinos also claims he typically worked 60 to 70 hours a week, sometimes more, and says he never received any overtime compensation. To save money, he told us he shared a room with four or five other workers. He says the few times he attempted to question how dire his situation had become, his job was threatened. You understood that you were in this country legally, and yet you felt like you had no rights? Sí. You have no idea, no experience in this country. No one has told you what your rights are. No one told us how to live here in the U.S. We live from work to the motel, and from the motel to work. Resino slowly began to realize that his work conditions would not get any better. And then, at the end of his fourth season, he says Express Forestry stopped paying him altogether. He alleges he confronted management and got the runaround. Eventually, working with the Southern Poverty Law Center, he filed a lawsuit against the company, claiming violations of minimum wage and overtime protections. 
Resino says he has still not received the deed to his family's land. We made repeated attempts to contact Express Forestry to get their side of the story, but we never heard back from the company. There are many people in the business community who say guest workers are a good idea. Don Moores is an immigration attorney who advises companies on how to get H-2B workers. He says that while he's heard about exploitation in the program, it's hardly the norm. For workers, they come, they're able to go back home with usually a lot of money in their pockets. Many of them come back after having bought a new house, having bought property, pay for the school of their, of their kids and, and family members. How broad is the American economy's dependence on foreign guest workers? Country as a whole, the GDP would barely register a blip if there was no H-2B guest worker program. Specific communities, though, around the country it would be devastating. From Alaska and salmon roe processors, the eastern shore of, of Maryland are seafood processors. Uh, landscape uh, uh, folks were the, the, the northern half of the U.S. So it's, it's widespread. It appears that the needs of the business community have been heard. On Thursday, the Senate passed legislation that would create a new and expanded guest worker program of 200,000. Ramos is concerned Congress is selling out to big business. You would say what about a guest worker program? It's a good thing to do? It's the right thing to do? Or it's traveling down the wrong well, road? Well, it's, it's, it's the political thing to do uh, because it, it, it fits politicians' purposes. Uh, if, if you really want to do something for folks, give them the freedom of choice, uh, not to be uh, tied down to just one employer. The Senate bill proposes a fix. It's called portability. It allows workers to move between jobs within the guest worker program. But the bill faces an uphill challenge in the House before it becomes law. Ramos says if history is any indicator of how guest workers will make out in the new program, it doesn't look good. Foreign guest workers don't vote. U.S. employers vote. And who's on their side? The U.S. government. The U.S. government is not on the side of guest workers. Never will be. Once again, from New York City, Public Broadcasting's David Brancaccio. If you're looking for something interesting to do with your internet connection, you can get more on the guest worker program and proposed legislation. The address is pbs.org. Now, since you've been favoring us with your time, we'll try to favor you with some perspective on this key issue that faces us. What to do about the one, not with the Q, but with the N, Iran, the country the U.S. suspects of developing nuclear weapons. Iran's U.N. ambassador said late this week his country wants to work directly with the U.S. to resolve the nuclear issue. But first, the U.S. has to agree that Iran has a right to nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. U.S. officials reject talks unless Iran stops enriching uranium. Joining me with a special perspective is the Iranian-French journalist Lila Azamzangineh, who has recently edited a collection of essays about contemporary Iranian culture and politics. Welcome, Lila. Thank you. So here we are again, another Middle Eastern country that looks dangerous, looks spooky. What can we learn about the U.S. experience in Iraq that might help us find a path forward in Iran? Well, certainly one of the first things that we can learn from the Iraqi experience is that violence does not work, antagonizing the people of the Middle East does not work. Unfortunately, the more you call them evil, the more you refuse to engage in dialogue, the more you conjure up a reality that perhaps didn't quite exist in that way before you pronounce those words. It's hard to be friendly, though, with that Iranian regime. I mean, they are pretty extreme. and. Uh, it makes it easier for the Bush administration to wedge Iran into their axis of evil paradigm when the president of Iran says things like, the Holocaust is a myth. 
of course. It's a, it's a tricky situation. It's infinitely difficult in terms of diplomacy. But it's also vital at this point for the American government to try and engage them in a way. Um, there was a letter, as you know, that was published uh, by Mr. Ahmadinejad to President Bush a few weeks ago. The famous 18-page letter from e the Iranian e president. Exactly. And that letter, in, in reality, was reeking with insecurity and inferiority complex. And those people, they're just waiting to be addressed. And the more you address them, even if it's in a diplomatic way, even if you're playing games and you know you never lose track of who you're really talking to, that's how you're going to break the ice and be able to make progress. And that's a more cunning and probably a more efficient way to get out of the deadlock today. You see these signs of insecurity in that famous letter. Do you think it's the president of Iran or do you think it is symbolic of a deeper insecurity that you might see more pervasively in Iranian culture? Of course, I think it's both. And, uh, and part of the reason why people have been talking about the nuclear bomb is that it gives them a sense of identity. The more they say, well, we are a power to, we exist, we want to be counted in, in the nuclear clan and in the nuclear game. And that speaks to, of course, an, an enormous identity crisis after 20 years of Islamic revolution. And, and when you think of the fact that these people are so very different from their leaders, they're, they're humane, they have very private lives, they go about thinking their own thoughts, having their own political hopes and dreams. And of course, they're very, they're taken aback, they're puzzled, they're frustrated to see that the government that represents them, unfortunately, is just does not really, is not an, an accurate image of who they are. But what they share is this deep sense of, of uh, fear and, again, insecurity. It's one of the ironies, because this government that is so repressive of any kind of dissident thought. I mean, just this week there was practically a riot by some Iranian students. Mm -hmm. A lot of rocks were thrown, some police went to the hospital, some students, there were arrests. That same government, someone like you is asking us to take it slowly, to engage. There's no irony there? Of course there is, but again, unfortunately, I don't personally don't believe that uh, politics is necessarily the realm for, for, for morals. Uh, with Iran, you need a more pragmatic approach. Otherwise, we're on a collision course, uh, and collision is not a good idea for Iran, because as we saw in Iraq, as you just said, if, if I'm, we're not even talking about invasion, but if there are military strikes against Iran, the consequences can be devastating, both for the population of Iran and in terms of uh, Middle Eastern geopolitics. So you have to try, in order to to somehow divert this uh, collision from happening, you must try to engage them somehow. We should try and open up Iran. Of course, that's counterintuitive because when you're dealing with a very fierce enemy, you just want to antagonize it and threaten it and tell him you're going to crush him with all your might. But maybe that's not the right way. Opening the country is an enormous hope for Iran because Iran is a very educated country, quite different uh, in many ways from neighboring Arab countries in terms of the education of girls, for instance. 60% of students at the University of Tehran are girls. They can work, they can drive, they have public jobs. You have women in parliament. Uh, you have women lawyers, as we know, because of the Nobel Peace Prize of 2003, Shireen Abadi. Uh, there's an electoral process. You have a thriving civil society in Iran. And the more you give it a chance to speak, the more you are really fueling the hope of Iran. And there is so much of it. It's, it's not just education, it's also youth. 70% of the country is under the age of 30. Well, that's an important point, Leela, that it is a very young country, mm -hmm. as you say. But the Bush administration hasn't just been talking a war of words in the past three years. The, we have been trying, the United States has been trying to encourage change from within, mm -hmm. but it keeps getting pushed back. We have to let time run its course. I think there is great hope for democracy in Iran, but it's not going to be tomorrow. Look even at the Soviet Union and Putin and all the convulsions. It might come 40, 50 years. I believe Iran might well be one of the first real home uh, bred democracies of the Middle East, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. And I know in the meantime, the situation is very tricky. It's awfully difficult and very, very complex, but there are still ways to talk to them before it's too late. And we must talk to Iran. Well, Leela, thank you. Thank you. Journalist Leela Azam Zankine is a social critic and a writer, as well as the editor of My Sister Guard Your Veil, My Brother Guard Your Eyes, Uncensored Iranian Voices. <laughs> Next week on Now, 
who owns the internet and how that debate could affect if you can get what you want from the web. What the cable and telephone companies are proposing is essentially erecting a toll booth right in the middle to uh, direct traffic, create an express lane for the products and services that they own, and uh, leave everybody else on a winding dirt road. And that's it for now. From New York, I'm David Brancaccio. We'll see you next week. To order this episode of Now on DVD, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Connect to Now online at pbs.org. Read more of our interview with a guest worker. Get an overview of current immigration proposals. Also, are we paying enough attention to Iran? Connect to Now at pbs.org.